back. And uh, I'm not on my own today. I've got a gaggle of gals here joining me. And we're talking, you know, like we do, we're talking all about menopause with members of the Menopause Collective. Thank you so much, ladies, for joining me yet again. We're talking today all about pain. And pain is something that around this time of perimenopause, menopause, and even postmenopause, that women are struggling more perhaps, with pain than they might have ever done before in their lives. And so that's why we're talking about pain today. So I'd like to say hello to uh, to everyone in the room. Thank you for joining me. Tamar, hello. How are you? Hello. Good, thank you. Not in pain good. currently. Hurrah. <laughs> Hurrah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a relief. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jackie, how are you today, Jackie? Yep, yeah, all good, thank you. Yes. Good. And uh, Claire, how are you doing, Claire? I'm, I'm here for the that's She's all I'd like here. to say about that. I know. And what we know about menopause is, particularly in that time approaching menopause, the hormone estrogen plays into the whole biochemistry and, and not just in the re- reproductive system, but in the, in the organs, the heart, the brain, and uh, just about everywhere. And there have been some studies that show that estrogen has this role in, uh, in the inflammatory processes and uh, and so when our estrogen levels are fluctuating, then inflammation in and around the body can be varying. And it's definitely, as a physiotherapist, it's definitely a time when we notice people coming to us, women that is, with more tendinopathies like tennis elbow, uh, like mm. plantar fasciitis. Oh, gosh, there, there's lots of that around. And uh, frozen shoulder, definitely lots more of that. But people can become more sort of pain sensitive around this time as well. And uh, so there's physiology at play. And that's the thing that's really key to understand this uh, this link with our physiology. However, there is also the, the mind piece of this puzzle. It makes a contribution to how we perceive our pain. And so I'm speaking as somebody who I injured my back when I was in my 20s, lifting a patient back in the day. And I've experienced on and off over the years back pain. And um, and so I, you know, I have lived with this experience of pain. How we deal with pain is very individual to each of us, isn't it? So is, is that speaking to anybody else's experiences of life, having lived with discomfort Claire you're nodding yes I am no I am um, had a lot of pain and discomfort in my abdomen area lower abdomen uh-huh. and digestive tract because that's where I get most of my that's where I hold my stress and tension and um I well I was in so much pain that's why I had my hysterectomy because it was just oh, so yeah. ongoing and debilitating and that did solve the problem for me but with hindsight, I would have kind of looked into other things that would have been causing that inflammation in the first place, rather than just thinking, I'm in pain, I have to stop this. It's kind of like, I think now I know I would be asking, I'm in pain, why am I in pain? What am mm. I doing? What are my habits that no longer serve me? What am I eating that um, is triggering inflammation in my body? How am I thinking? Are my thought processes negative, which the other two will happily speak to, I'm sure, and what it can do to the physiognomy. So I think that, yeah, I think with pain, is it's, it's, it's a message, isn't it? It's a very loud message from your body saying, stop, do something differently. It's not a just swallow a pill and take some pain relief. Yeah, no, you, you're absolutely right. I think what's really important for us all to acknowledge is how complex pain is. And uh, and so it's a subjective experience that is individual to each of us. Um, it's It may be a localised sensation, but equally it could be that we've got multiple uh, sensitive, painful areas through the body, and that's often... Uh, termed fibromyalgia isn't it when they find these multiple tender spots generally in muscle bellies around the body it's so complex that we can only really skim across the surface of this but suffice it to say estrogen has a part to play in inflammation and so uh, and so does lots of other things that we can do 
in our lives. So the, the things that we consume, the thoughts that we think, we know that all of these uh, things can come together to contribute to our experiences in life. And, that, and pain is just another one of those, isn't it? Tamar, what, what sorts of things are we talking about when we say that maybe our experiences in our lives can influence how we perceive situations? Because that's the kind of a generic principle, if you like, isn't it? But it does also apply to painful sensations. Yeah, so pain will mean different things to different people and your life experiences will feed into that. So people that have lived a lifetime of chronic pain when menopause pain adds to that, their baseline is already going to be higher than people that haven't. Um, and the upbringing that you've been brought up in. So I think we mentioned on a previous conversation, you know, parents that are sympathetic when you hurt yourself and parents that go on, you know, walk it off, man up. You know, your opinion on pain and whether you manage it in the moment or kind of shut it away can have an impact on how you manage pain then in the future as adults. Yeah, no, I, I mean, that's that's a big part of it, actually. Uh, you know, and I had a lot of trouble when my kids were little because I'm, I'm like a panicker. I can't help myself. I would be panicking. They'd be on the floor and I'd be panicking. Hopefully that hasn't uh, caused too many problems for them. It's how you think about it and how you choose to respond. So it's important to let the child self regulate that a little bit and you, obviously you teach them to start with but then we also know you know in, in therapy that trauma can come out as physical pain in the body and you know I agree with Claire that you don't put a stick in plaster over something you look for the core of what the issue is but if the issue is a trauma that you don't remember in your conscious mind you know people come with IBS and actually it's a stress response from something that happened 30 years ago and so Sometimes trying to find the core of the pain is not is not as easy as going to the doctor and getting a scan or a blood test and mm. things like that. Yeah, no, I mean that's that's a big part. Trauma, uh, you know, and trauma actually affects us uh, in the synthesis of hormones. It can it can change the way in which uh, hormones are, are are balanced. You know, whatever you want to call it, and so that's partly why around menopause unprocessed trauma can be something that sort of rears its head again for for us and then that that's been my experience and uh and so trauma is really a very important thing that if uh, i mean it's hard if it's not something that you remember but i suppose if you start to get those feelings associated around uh fear perhaps uh and and anxiety lots of anxiety around then it may be that a session with somebody like you, Jackie, it, it uncovers hidden, uh, you know, things beneath the surface that we, we maybe had not recalled, perhaps. Mm, very much so. I mean, even just the word fear, that's, that's a really big one when it comes to pain, because it's how we perceive pain. Um, if we perceive it as something fearful, then um, we feel it a lot more intensely. So that's one of the things that, you know, I address an awful lot if I have clients that are suffering pain. It's, it's what does it mean to us? What are the background thoughts around it? What's the anxiety that it's creating? Um, because for a lot of people that might be suffering long term chronic pain, um, it, I mean, it taps into multiple different things. Um, it could be that they have unhelpful thinking that means that they stop partaking and participating in parts of life and then when we start to shrink life um, there's the risks of depression um, and hangs and hangsta uh, anxiety so multiple things so you know, a lot of people you know if they're feeling pain um, if the background thought is constantly niggling as to What's really wrong with me? Is it something else? Is it something bigger than what I'm initially being told? And it's this continued ruminating and thinking about it that does actually enhance it. So thoughts, emotions, feelings um, that we place on pain are all really relevant and very much part of ongoing pain management, um, along with obviously the physiotherapy side, because it's important for people who are experiencing pain to know that actually they perhaps can still move and they can still participate in life. Maybe a, a half hour walk is too much, but is a 10 minute walk 
okay. You know, so if a half minute, half an hour walk is too much and they think that's it, I can't do anything, I can't go out, then that all leads to unhelpful thinking. If, however, a five minute walk is okay or a 10 minute walk is okay without um, perhaps the debilitating pain and fatigue that comes with fibromyalgia, then what we're helping the client to do is to tap into something that would be a little bit more of a positive um, thought process and what can I do? What is achievable? And the more that we can build these positive thoughts, the more empowered um, somebody feels you know so it's it's increasing that level of self-efficacy so that they can think mm. they can do rather than can't do but that all you know backs up to the initial thought processes mm. I can't partake I can't do are they truthful are those thoughts really really truthful so yeah then m- multiple things come into play yeah pain. Well, you know, and this is the other thing, Claire, that it, it isn't just the body and it isn't just what we eat, but it's also, and the thoughts that we think, but, but, but our, uh, our upbringing in terms of our parenting, but, but also our spirituality has a part to play in, um, in interpreting our life experiences. So uh, is that something that you could speak to, Claire? Yeah, sure. So the way I would find that out is um, by doing someone's astrology chart gives me an indication of kind of like how I can see their medical vulnerabilities. So where they need to be taking care. So I can see that in someone's birth chart. I can see all someone, everyone's medical vulnerabilities, but I can also see the psychological things and the lifetime wounds that the soul has chosen to experience in this lifetime. And then when you look at the planetary alignment, like there's been a lot of talk about recently, certainly in the circles I'm in, um, about the great reset and what's going on. When you understand that, you can see why certainly people would feel in pain at certain points because certain planets are in certain positions on positions that are reflected in their birth chart so it's like a call to action so there's all these different layers that yes astrology can give you to help you to understand especially as again if it's in that hidden part of you if you've got things in the fourth house or the 12th house of your chart those can be really really deep rooted especially fourth house is family roots and past so deep rooted trauma that you've probably buried, put a rose tinted haze over. And then when you get to menopause, you're suddenly like, why have the wheels fallen off the bus? And it's like, because as you say, all that unresolved estrogen's no longer there to keep soothing it down. It's like, blasters off, here we go. And then the 12th house, the hidden self. So the part we don't reveal to ourselves and can spend a lifetime getting to know. So it is fascinating, I must say. Other cultures, you know, cultural influences. I, I was working in the, the pain clinic uh, at the hospital near where I live. And uh, the physiotherapist that I worked alongside was Indian. You know, and he was saying that uh, females, women in India, essentially don't expect to live long their expectation is that compared to the in the west he said they expect to live probably about 10 years less than we do and it's not so much that that's the life expectancy but maybe historically that was the case and uh, and so that you know it, it was interesting for me then that I, when i'm talking to people who are the same age but from different cultural backgrounds their, uh, the whole viewpoint on life and what it should look like at a certain age is it can be very different. So when I'm asking you know these women to do movement exercise and they're thinking, oh, I'm way too old for that, you know, these influences come into play, our mm-hmm. cultural influences, our spiritual beliefs, our uh, life experiences to date, our parenting, stuff that we maybe can't even remember having been exposed to, you know. So it does mean that pain is a very complex topic for us to uh, to deal with. However, uh, this is the good news. There are, some, there are some kind of general principles that apply across the board uh, when we're dealing with processing, understanding. And for me, one of the things that I, I like to try and be able to do is demystify this whole process as much as is uh, humanly possible for me anyway to do. And so when I'm talking about 
physical problems in the body, things somebody's maybe got a osteoarthritis in their knee, then I, I try as best as I can to paint that a picture in a positive light so patients rather will come to me and say oh somebody said to me oh it's just bone on bone you know whether it's a doctor whoever and uh, and that to them has real negative connotations but if we think that bone can be as smooth as smooth as glass you know and maybe bone on bone isn't so bad after all what really matters is that we have strong leg muscles to support our knee joints. Talking about the knee, I guess. It is very much around our perceptions of, mm. of the things that's wrong with us. And, you know, the thing that Jackie said, people, if they're really wanting to know, I, I've never met a human who doesn't want to know. You know, it's really just in our nature to to want to try and unpick and understand what's going on with us. And I think oftentimes uh, professionals can dumb things down when they're ex- making th- explaining things to us. And often maybe they're underestimating our ability to understand or perhaps they're short on time. And, uh, and you, you know, you do tend to get a little bit of a, uh, what's the word, a script around describing how we describe certain things. You find yourself saying the same things over and over again to different people. Well, not everybody's the same, are they, it turns out. So having a tailored script, how we how we describe things to, to different people, describe it differently, perhaps. I'll never forget hearing a physiotherapist talking about the tendon in the shoulder and imagine a rope over the edge of a cliff. I mean, how frightening is that one? That is really scary, the thought that the rope over the edge of the cliff is fraying. <laughs> that was the, the gist of it. <laughs> <laughs> and and this is what happens to the tendon in the shoulder. Well, you know, degeneration happens. It's what happens to all of us. Uh, it happens over time and it's inevitable to a certain extent. But do we want to paint a picture that is really quite frightening? Uh, and I'm, you know, and, it, and we're all guilty of, of thinking of things. Oh, how can I portray what is a difficult uh anatomical, physiological concept, how can I portray that in a way that an ordinary person on the street could understand? And so we can sometimes fall foul of dumbing things down to the point of making it uh, potentially frightening and sometimes even wrong. So, uh, you know, so that's the thing that I really try to do. And to, and to, you know, like Jackie said, movement is medicine, motion is lotion, strong muscles protect joints, strong muscles offload joints. Moving well makes a difference. Uh, you know, if you're going to lift your arm up, it's worth sitting up straight before you do it. If you're slumping down and lifting your arm up, it's not so good, is it? So uh, Jackie sat up straight then when I did that. <laughs> and then, of course, the other thing is around inflammation. And uh, and so, like I said, estrogen is does have a part to play in, in uh, moderating inflammatory processes in the body. Then we, we don't have that, that component in the equation. It's like a recipe. You leave something out and it's not quite the same uh, cookie that you get at the end of it, is it? So we need to be aware of all the things that we put into our bodies that might contribute to that inflammatory process going on. Whether it's acute inflammation, guess what? My son came home from Halfords yesterday and he had where he works and he had his finger in a dressing and he spent three hours in A&E after he caught his finger in a bike wheel. <laughs> when he was trying to fix it. So right now, today, his finger's throbbing, a bit like on the cartoons, you know, your finger full of nerve endings. It's sore. So, uh, you know, you would expect that, wouldn't you? That's kind of normal. For a couple of days, it's in a dressing and, and it's probably a bit sore. And then after that, it should start to improve and ease off. And so that's an acute inflammatory reaction inflammation has a part to play in healing it releases all those chemicals that moderate that inflammatory process and over time the resolution and of inflammation occurs and, and you're all good and his finger will be fine and he'll be off, off again but it's when inflammation becomes chronic and uh, and it's sitting around in the body the body has this general raised level of inflammation that is constant in the background and, uh, and so we know that there are things that we can do 
that speak to inflammation. And one of the things is uh, the things that we consume. So I'm going to ask uh, Jackie, I'm quite sure that you know uh, some of those things that drive inflammation and the things that we can do as a, a, to combat. Mm. Well, one of, one of the biggest things that drives inflammation, obviously, is sugar. Um, when we've got raised glucose levels within our body, um, we experience more inflammation. And this is one of the things of why it ties in with the drop in the estrogen. We have... Mm glucose levels becoming unbalanced and that's why we can feel exacerbated pain so if we're then consuming a diet that's full of sugar we're further raising that blood glucose level even more which really heightens um, inflammation which increases mm -hmm. pain level so what we eat does play a huge part into everything i mean not even you know when, when, when we think of pain um we're thinking of um you know actually having an injury but this also impacts even into the pain that people have through cystitis utis mm -hmm. raised glucose levels increased pain it's um it all links in what we eat you know so having to you know looking after what we're Having nice balanced diet, helping to keep blood glucose levels nice and steady really helps. And that's where, um, you know, if we're stressed around pain, mm -hmm. stress raises those glucose levels again, impacting inflammation, increasing mm -hmm. pain levels. So, yeah, it does all, all tie into those fluctuations that are happening in the hormones. It can be really hard to to put all these pieces of the puzzle together and some of them you know like uh, caffeine and alcohol alcohol is a big one actually when it comes to inflammation and uh, what are they selling us on the telly you know gin o'clock and uh, and all of that but if you are in pain and if if you are wanting to feel better then I would probably counsel you against doing that. What do you think, Claire? Oh, absolutely. I mean, all of these things, as you say, black tea, so caffeine, coffee, alcohol, nicotine, all of these things that once were used in ceremony and understood and taken in small amounts to kind of help bring us to different dimensions so we could connect with spirit have been abused. And so everyone takes them in like huge quantities and it's just well we're encouraged to aren't we you know there's chocolate everywhere at the moment because it's easter oh, and literally the supermarket's swimming in it <laughs> and it's just it's just awful because it's like so and processed foods and all of these things that just don't do us any good whatsoever but when we're in menopause we often feel quite irritated we don't necessarily feel like we want to be particularly good at self care and yet if you don't, then you land up in pain. It's a kind of, it can, you can get yourself into a really vicious cycle, which is why it's helpful to come and see someone like us to basically yeah. go, let's look at what you're doing. Let's change some of these habits because we want to get you into a place where you're not caught up in this vicious circle of hell. Yeah. Actually, I, I had an, an interesting piece of information the other week when I was, I don't know what I was doing, uh, but vitamin D deficiency uh, can lead us to almost have the symptoms that uh, correlate with rheumatoid arthritis so uh, you know I was listening to a podcast that's what it was and he was and this gent was saying about uh, vitamin d deficiency start off feeling like uh, you might get start plantar fasciitis in your feet ankles knees pain uh, and then you know eventually pain in the whole of your body and um I think there's no doubt that everybody in this Western Hemisphere should be supplementing vitamin D. Uh, they said, unless you're in there in the sun, butt naked, uh, getting a, a good dose, then uh, we are just simply not getting enough. And now we're using sunscreens and such like, we're definitely not getting a, a, enough. If you've got deficiencies in your body, so for some people who are really struggling, then it, it tailored approaches to nutrition are important. For it's about understanding your body, isn't it? You, you, you need to understand your body. And from what I can tell, inflammation is the core of all illness. So inflammation generally is a good thing to work on. Every illness in the human, I don't know about animals, um, it's all down to inflammation. <laughs> so if you can do something on your inflammation, then it's all good.
Thank you. The thoughts we think can increase inflammation, and uh, mm. you know, and and so managing our this experience that we're having, which is just really called life, it takes a village for one, which is why we are together here in this room today. And there's more of us who are not here today, and and it takes a multifaceted approach. And uh, you know what? When you do it, it works. That's all I'm going to say. So, you know, there's all these different elements to, for us to consider. It's lifestyle medicine uh, as much as we can possibly throw at it is, is, where I, is where I sit. And movement is my modus operandi. But, of course, I couldn't do it without you, lovely ladies. So thank you so much for being here today in the room. And um, I just hope that we... You know, if you do have any questions, you'll come and find us in the Moving Through Menopause Facebook group uh, and get in touch with any of us. We're here to help. That's the whole idea, isn't it? So thank you again. Thank you so much. Take care. Have a fabulous rest of your day. Bye for now.